One of the seven wonders of the ancient world, according to medieval chronicles, the Pharaohs has given its name to lighthouses around the world and remains a symbol of ancient engineering and construction skills. Yet, invested as it was by ancient Roman and medieval Arab writers with magical, almost supernatural powers, data concerning the design and functioning of the tower remain sketchy. The tallest stone tower in the world for more than 17 centuries, the integrity of the pharaohs withstood the weathering of ages until a series of earthquakes caused its top tiers to fall, leading to its effective demolition in the 14th century. The Lighthouse of Alexandria is, for the first time, being explored by modern technologies at the site it was said to have stood, and the results are so dramatic that they not only confirm the lighthouse was very real, but also the proportions of such a structure are absolutely staggering. Wait till you hear this. For decades on the banks of Alexandria, there has been massive columns sitting in plain sight for, well, for as long as anyone can remember. It is now known that the huge columns, along with other pieces now found under the water close to the location in question, would have formed a grand entrance to the lighthouse and this doorway alone is an astonishing 200 tons. Underwater photo techniques in archaeology in Egypt is a completely new experience applied for the first time on the submerged archaeological site of the Lighthouse of Alexandria, which is situated on the eastern extremity of the ancient island of Pharos at the foot of Coit Bay Fort at a depth of 2 to 9 meters. The CEA Lex launched a 3D photo data gathering program for the virtual reassembly of broken artifacts in 2010. And by 2014, methods were being developed and refined to acquire manual photographic data of the entire underwater site at Quait Bay using a DSLR camera, simple and low cost material to obtain a digital surface model of the submerged site of the lighthouse, and also to create 3D models of the objects themselves, such as statues, bases of statues, and architectural elements. Back in 1994, the Center d'Etudes Alexandrians launched the first scientific excavation in the field of underwater archaeology in Egypt on the submerged site of the Lighthouse of Alexandria, situated on the eastern extremity of the ancient island of Pharos, at the foot of Quait Bay Fort, which was constructed at the end of the 15th century by the Mamluk Sultan Quait Bay. The submerged site was discovered in 1960 thanks to the pioneering work of Camille Aboul Elisdat, and in 1968, Honor Frost undertook a UNESCO mission on the site, which led to the publication of a preliminary report revealing the importance of the site. The underwater site of Quait Bay Fort holds the ruins of the Lighthouse of Alexandria, a legendary monument that stood for 17 centuries. It was built towards the beginning of the 3rd century BC and was assembled until the end of the 14th century. The last mention of the visible presence of its ruins dates to 1420, almost 60 years before the construction of the fort. Underwater excavations did begin way back in 1994 under the direction of Dr. Jean Yeves Emperor in the hope of shedding new light on the question of the image of the lighthouse. The excavations led to the reconstitution of certain parts of the lighthouse and to an understanding of the design process. Nevertheless, the study of the site ran up against the limitations of traditional data recording methods. The extent and unique nature of this sunken site have encouraged innovation in data gathering, both as regards the ancient material, which it's estimated to have more than 3,525 very heavy blocks, and the overall site itself. After many years of diving on the site, painstakingly mapping out the entire area and photographing every inch of the debris to the tune of over 50,000 photos, the team were able to give a comprehensive 3D map and reconstruction of where the lighthouse would have stood and what it looked like, leaving us with little doubt that it was here at this place that the great lighthouse was constructed. Indeed, it was a skyscraper of antiquity.
The Pharos is one of those structures whose beauty, size, and expense were capable of causing the astonishment of its contemporary world and later generations. It also had a particular objective, and the fact that at the time of Chronicles, like Gregory of Tours, the lighthouse was not only continuing to perform its original function, and incredibly, 1,000 years after its construction, but still outstripped the most grandiose of medieval church towers in height. Drawing upon the literary sources of the ancient world, Dutch artist Martin van Hermskerk probably reflected the ideas of his time in his depiction of the Pharos. The Pharos was richly decorated in white marble and with numerous sculptures, demonstrating that it was designed to be much more than a navigational tower. Poets and engineers teamed up to praise it, stating never in the history of architecture has a secular building been thus worshipped and taken on a spiritual life of its own. Like all great buildings, the Pharos inspired a host of imitations and today retains its place in the Hall of Fame as an exceptional example of ancient common sense and splendid engineering, which marked the entrance to Alexandria, the greatest city in the Mediterranean for 17 centuries. However, at the time of its designation as an ancient wonder, the character and function of the lighthouse was shrouded in myth and legend. The dazzling grandeur of the building lent itself to hyperbole and rereading the ancient and medieval accounts of a structure so huge that a troop of cavalry could get lost amongst its many chambers or plunge to their deaths through its glass floors, or a mirror so potent that it could reveal far-off cities and of statues which reacted to the arrival of enemy fleets. Even modern researchers have been hard-pressed to distinguish fact from fiction. Fortunately, a number of eyewitness accounts do provide seemingly reliable measurements and keen observational comments, which have been used to recreate a semblance of the original structure. Alexander the Great is credited for the founding of this glorious ancient city on the Egyptian coast, which still bears his name, Alexandria. However, the site was not virgin land when Alexander eyed it around 332 BC. Strabo notes that the pharaohs had utilized the area as a guard post to prevent the importation of foreign goods and the entry of merchants. Substantial remains of breakwaters, keys, and harbor installations in the open sea to the north and west of Pharaoh's Island are earlier than the foundation of the city. The Isle of Pharos was itself famous before the construction of the lighthouse. It is mentioned in Homer's Odyssey as situated in the rolling seas off the mouth of the Nile. It was stated by Homer to be a day's sail from the Egyptian mainland. This has led to many attempts to explain the exaggerated distance suggested by Homer on the part of classicists, and some have concluded that the geography is mythical rather than real, though it is an anomalous document from a renowned documenter. Starbo also describes the Isle of Pharos as a small oblong island which lies quite close to the continent, forming towers in its harbor with a double entrance. Plutarch's Life of Alexander links his hero to the island through the median of a dream in which it is said that Alexander beheld an old man who spoke in verse. According to this legend, Alexander then immediately went to the spot, realized its suitable location for a city, and set about tracing his plans in the soil. It is said that the architect of Alexandria was Dinocrates of Rhodes, who connected the pharaohs to the mainland by means of a mile-long causeway known as the Hepstadion, which was a giant causeway often referred to as a mole or dike built in the 3rd century BC, during the Ptolemaic period. The Hepstadion was created to link Pharos Island to the mainland coast and given a name based on its length. Alexander did not live to enjoy the city built in his name, dying of a fever in Babylon in 323 BC. But Alexandria thrived, quickly rivaling Rome as a center for trade, culture, and philosophy. With the posthumous division of Alexander's empire, Egypt fell to Ptolemy Soter, Soter meaning savior, 
given the title for having saved the island of Rhodes from Demetrius of Macedonia. Alexandria would serve as the capital of the Ptolemaic kings for the next 300 years. It is Ptolemy Soter who is credited with beginning the construction of the lighthouse on the island of Pharos. He died while it was still being built, leaving its completion to his son, Ptolemy Philadelphus. Along with the precise date of its erection, the question of who built the Pharos is also a matter of debate. A commemorative inscription engraved on one side of the Pharos is open to various interpretations. Strabo translated it stating that Sostratus, the Cnidian, friends of the sovereigns, dedicated the building for the safety of those who sail the seas. The first problem concerns the identity of Sostratus. Pliny the Elder eventually considered him to have been the architect of the building. However, the naming of a builder on a monument was most unusual at the time, when it would have been more seemly to dedicate the structure to the ruler, Ptolemy. Lucian also assumes that the Sostratus named in the inscription was that of a famous engineer. But classicists contend that this man, Sostratus of Sinitus, could not be associated with the building of the pharaohs as the dates do not match, suggesting instead that a diplomat of the same name is a more likely candidate. What then was his link to the pharaohs? The wording of the inscription is ambiguous. It can mean either that Sostratus erected the building or that he merely dedicated it. Since it was more unusual to record the name of a donor, it has been suggested that Sostratus may have been the founder rather than the designer of the pharaohs. A recent assessment of the three sites at Alexandria, the library, Stanley Bridge, and the fort of Quate Bay have led to some conclusions that Alexandria lying close to two seismogenic zones, namely the active subduction Hellenic arc and the low seismicity Egyptian coastal zones is presently an area of moderate seismic hazard. Since it is known that the pharaohs itself experienced a series of damaging earthquakes, it is interesting to speculate on the extent to which the design of the building rendered it vulnerable to earthquake damage, or conversely, whether its configuration, like other long-lived monuments in seismically active zones, helped to ensure its survival for 17 centuries. We will leave it at that for the moment, but we will be back just shortly with more on the Great Monument of Alexandria. In the meantime, comments below, guys, and as always, thank you for watching.